Hello and welcome. It is Friday, so it is How to Diorama with Scale Modelcraft. I'm Bill, and and thanks very much uh, for for coming by. Um, uh, Paul was on earlier today, so I just wanted to say hi to Paul, and and um, he, you know, he had a, a, a an interest. I'm going to see which one. Um, he said, I have uh, viewed the shorts. I hope you're going to go ahead and show more detailed pick of the lab bench. It interests me in your thought process. Well, yeah, I am. And thanks very much for asking about that, Paul. So what we're doing, and I'm going to, let me see if I can go to this other shot here real quick. So this is, uh, this week I worked on Captain Livin's laboratory. And so what it is, is inside the diorama that I'm building. Oh, I've got other stuff to show, but I'm just going to run to that. So here is, man, I'm all over the place. That's where we're going to be building today. So this is, you know, what I'm going to try and do and show you all the stuff that I put in that little box, really, um, uh, which is Captain Livin's laboratory. And, and, and this is our World War I diorama and and that's an underground element so okay so now that you know everything's all over the place i'm going to try to get this all set back up because i got a lot of stuff i want to show you today it, it was a really fun week um oh and we got some more people coming in there's john hello john uh i really appreciate you coming in i haven't talked to you this week much uh i've been really busy i'm sure you have been um and it's really nice to see you um we also have Martin is here. Martin, cheers from Holland, boys and girls. Hello, Martin. Thanks very much for coming by. It's great to see you. Sleezen is here. Hey, Sleezen and I had and and I had some great conversations about well, texts really um, about you know what I'm doing this week, and and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so we're gonna go over all that kind of stuff. Um, let's see. I think that's everybody. So let's start in. So I wanted to start in first off by saying. After the meeting or the live stream last week on Friday, um, the following day, Saturday, I had the Seattle Amps folks come over to the, um, the shop. And, you know, I, I've talked about this before. I don't have people to the shop. It's just not something I do. There's one person, Stephen Robbins. Um, he can come over and then that's cool. You know, we're friends been for a long time. But I'm really kind of, I don't know, weirds me out having people over in the shop. Well, it was fantastic. I had a wonderful time and folks came over. So I got a couple of pictures I want to show you about that. And I think it'll be kind of fun. So uh, there's the shop. And, and so I had folks come over and uh, a friend of mine, Morgan, who's in our club, took this picture. Uh, this is me talking like I know something uh, to other folks in the, uh, the club. And what we're doing is I did a basic diorama kind of a presentation, I guess, and, and showed folks like some different techniques. And I made it available so that folks could build their own diorama base or more of a display base because we didn't get really too deep into it. It's only a three hour meeting, but it was a lot of fun. And so I showed folks how, you know, the tools that I use, we got to use the downdraft table, we got to, you know, put ground on some displays. We glued up some folks' displays. And it was just a whole lot of fun. And, and I really enjoyed it. And that's like when I do my consulting, that's kind of what we do is I, I just do it here. It's, it's virtual, you know, and, and I have cameras and stuff. And, and I do that same kind of thing. So it was a whole lot of fun having people in the shop to do it. And um, I think everybody did have fun. I hope so, at least. Um, and so this is the Seattle crew. Now, this is not all of Seattle Amps. Seattle Amps is, is actually pretty good size. You know, we've got the Facebook group, but these are kind of the stalwarts. These are the folks that um, really come out to a lot of the meetings and, and certainly the build and displays and stuff like that. And um, if you're unfamiliar with Amps, Amps is the um, Armor Modeling and Preservation Society, and it is a modeling club that primarily focuses on armor, but that doesn't just mean tanks. There's lots of armor. So they don't do anything that really leaves the ground. Um, maybe if there's a armored hovercraft, I don't know. But yeah, it's mostly armor. And so if you're interested in that, the Facebook group is really fun because we get a lot of people there. And so this little QR code, you can just scan that. Uh, like right now, you can just scan it and, and get to that Facebook group. And then you know, you can join 
uh, th there's no cost to join. It's just a bunch of folks that like working on armor and, and that kind of thing. Hey, Scott is here. I want to say hello to Scott real quick. Hello, Scott. Hello, Bill. And the rest of you excellent modders. Thanks very much for coming in, Scott. That's really, really cool. Thank you. So, yeah, I had a great time last week, uh, you know, the, the, literally the Saturday afterwards. And then, funny enough, this next week, we're going to be going also to an event at the FH Cam. And FH Cam is the um, Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum. That's in Everett, Washington, next to the pain field where Boeing is at. And Boeing, that pain field, they use that for their test flights and stuff like that. And so this is a great museum. I've done it before. I think I've shared pictures and even, uh, you know, shorts and things like that when I'm there. It's really wonderful. Uh, some of those same folks are going to be able to come up there. And we just come in. We set up. The, the museum folks are just fantastic. They, I mean, they have everything set up for us. We, we set up our things. And then as people are coming through, we get to talk about model building. We get to talk about armor. We get to talk about, you know, dioramas in my case. And it's a really neat interactive experience for folks because they're there to see, you know, this armor and these aircraft and the museum. And then to speak to someone who works with that, it's a lot of fun. So if you're around, come on by. Uh, we're going to be there from, I think it's 10 to 5. I think we kind of take off around four just, you know, so that we're not holding up the museum as they're shutting down. I believe they're open until five. And so if you get the chance, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I will try my best to get much better pictures than I've done in the past. I've, I've just been really bad at that. I don't know why I get all involved in stuff and talking to people. And then I don't get the pictures that I say I want to get. So there you have it. Um, so let's go to some slides. I want to talk to you about Captain Livin's um, laboratory. So that's what I did this week. So this is the diorama. And, you know, the dioramas, uh, uh, I, I like to kind of show an orientation for folks that maybe aren't as familiar. Maybe they're a little bit new to the live stream. This is the diorama with all the wooden things that I've built pulled out. Now, that wooden stuff that I've made, it's all out of balsa wood and it's all out of basswood. And then I've taken it and I've treated it with um, the vinegar and steel wool solution. And what that does is it's like an aging solution. You know, it's been used for years by, by uh, uh, railroaders. And in, and in building railroad buildings and old shanty shacks and stuff like that, like barn wood. Um, and so that's where that's from. And so I use that and, and it gives a real nice patina to the wood. It makes it look aged and it gives me some nice color variation, which I really want. So here is the front of the diorama. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. I got another person came in and I, I love to say hello when folks stop in. Here's Mark. Hey, Mark, how's it going, sir? It is great to see you. Thanks very much for coming in. So here's the front of the diorama. Uh, and let's get over here. Sorry. Uh, there's the corner and we're kind of moving around it because I want to give you this orientation because I think the orientation to see where I'm putting this is sort of important, you know? Um, so here is the space that I cut out for Captain Livin's uh, laboratory. You've seen that before. I started out with just some very small, this is basswood. I built this frame. From the frame, I went ahead and just put uh, the balsa. So the frame is out of basswood. The wood that I've put on the outside is balsa wood. It's a little bit lighter than the basswood. It has a little bit more grain, and I wanted to see that grain. Um, so there's like the superstructure fit into that space, and, and that's how I did it the first time. I just kind of wanted to fill that space. I used kind of um, timber frame style and, and that's from also looking at movies and, and, and looking at reference materials from the trenches. And, and so that's where I came up with this. Then I went ahead and did this catwalk. I made it a two-story uh, little deal. And then I started making stuff for it. So that kind of catches us up to when I started building things. Now, this whole area for Captain Livens 
is his personal laboratory, laboratory, whatever you want to call it, study, I've even said, but it's where he's figuring out the fuel. And, and, and so this is very specific. This room is very specific to Captain Livens working on the fuel that's going to be used in um, his large flame projector or flamethrower is what I think the common, common thing you would say today is flamethrower. But it was called a flame projector in World War I, 1916, when he invented it. So he's working on this mix because the mix of fuel that was sprayed through this actual weapon, of course, uh, was a mix of kerosene and diesel. Now, obviously, each come from the same oil, and it's, it's, it's a process of, of separating and distillation that gives you either diesel or kerosene when you're working with oil. So my thoughts were, I need some kind of fancy looking distillation um, equipment. And that's what this is. So I am trying to build something that looks like a distillation. So it's a large tank and there's separators. I'm, I'm thinking there are separators in it. And then the coils on the outside are, are for cooling and, and things like that. So by by cooling the liquid, it's going to condense, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a, a little boiler pot there off to the side. And, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. It, it, it just, I'm trying to make it look like if I were working with liquids, if I were working with chemicals, this is the kind of thing that I would have. And, and so that's what this is supposed to be. Um, so these are all scratch built just out of some brass and stuff. And, and I do have video of this. Uh, I didn't take a lot of pictures of it. Next... I took this little wackiness and I made this. Now, I don't know what this is. I, you know, I like things where it looks like something kind of, but it, it really doesn't have, I don't even have a purpose for this thing, but I think it kind of looks neat. And it reminds me of some of the movies in the eighties that I love the science fiction movies. Uh, there was one, my science project. And uh, does anybody remember my science project where they find this alien uh, energy thing and, and they open it up and it opens up all these different things? Well, it's that. It's a, uh, a MacGuffin, right? It's this thing that doesn't really have a purpose. It looks kind of like something, but it does something, but it's, it, it's the focus of, of all the stuff. It's a widget. And so that's what this is. This is just like a little widget for me. And, and I kind of liked it. It almost looks like a radio, but then with all the wires, I thought it was fun. Um, it's actually a, uh, an engine, an, an aircraft engine from another kit that I had that I scratch built and uh, put this together. It still has to be painted. Everything is just basically, uh, you know, primed at this point and, and ready for paint later. So the next thing I did was some bookshelves. So it's a study and I wanted bookshelves. Um, I like the idea of the British officer uh, going to the field and having those little comforts that, that, that maybe other people think they can't afford to bring. And, and it's like the, the British officer saying, well, I'm going to bring it. You know, I need these things. And so these are bookshelves. And um, I made a whole bunch of books. Now, books are super easy. Um, I just took and cut strips of varying thicknesses of styrene. And here's the important part. I, man, you see, I, I start talking about this stuff and I don't have an example for you, but I can use this. Let's say this is styrene. And the only thing I want to do on one edge of it is I want to round it. I, I want to kind of get the spine of a book. So when I cut it, I'll get a, a relatively flat edge. Okay, and that's fine. And if I leave that there, it's just not going to look as cool as a book right? Especially in, I mean, on a shelf, you can totally tell. So all I'm doing is if this is styrene, I'm just taking this and I'm rounding this edge. So I'm just, you know, sanding it and rounding it as I go. And then I'll cut the strip off and then I can chop it and get little tiny books. I did not do like a series of books. I didn't do a collection of books. So they're all different. They're all a little bit different, right? So they're not the same size. And I want that. I wanted this variation. I didn't want like a collection of 10 books or something like that. 
because I needed to see the shadow lines. I needed to see the variation so I can get something. It's very small. And so I need to be able to bring that detail out. So if I made them all the same, I just wouldn't have got as, as good a detail. So let's go back and look at this. And I got a couple of questions real quickly. Sorry. Sleazen says, all your underground work and details inspired me to plan an interior for the huge house in my next diorama. That's very cool. Thank you very much, Sleazen. I, I love that because, I mean, look, I get great inspiration from other folks that I see online constantly, all the time. And I talk about my inspirations quite a bit. Last week, we talked about Neil Bullard. And Neil Bullard does amazing World War I stuff. And so a lot of stuff that I'm going to be doing this is going to be directly influenced from Neil Bullard. Sure, I've got my own ideas, but there's some details that Neil did that are just great. And I want to bring those forward in mind. So thanks. I'm, I'm really happy that I, I inspired you a little bit, Sleaze. And that's, that's really fun. I, I appreciate that because I, I really honestly want to do that. Scott says, I've heard of the term gizmology before, building things out of spare parts to fit a space. Yeah, and that's and that's really what it is, Scott. Um, it's it's just trying to get something interesting there because, you know, in the, okay, Doug McClure movies. Does anybody remember these? Journey to the whatever and, you know, it's just all these fanciful things, Journey to the Center of the Earth and, and, and those kinds of movies. Doug McClure was really fun. They were really kind of cheaply made movies. But the acting, though over the top, was wonderful as a kid. Well, in a lot of those movies, there just seemed to be this laboratory, right? Kind of like Sherlock Holmes laboratory, you know, where there's just all this arcane, weird looking stuff all over. It's super interesting. And I love that. So, I mean, if you look in the shop, that's, that's kind of what I've done here in the shop, right? And in my office, same kind of deal. Well, I'm doing the same thing in my dioramas. I just love all that arcane, weird, you know, gizmology, um, MacGuffin, whatever you want to call it. It's just an interesting thing. Now, most of the models that I have that I've built that are either in my office, shop, whatever, they, they perform a function. It might be wonky, whatever that function is, but it, it, it does something. And, and, and I think that's really a key. When you're trying to build something for your diorama, it's super important to make sure that it, it, it at least it has the look of doing something. They may not exactly know what it is, but if it's just a collection of something that just doesn't, meh, you know, it doesn't look like there's an input, there's an output. You know, those are the things I've talked about before. Some of the things that make your scratch building look a little bit more, maybe not real, but realistic right? If it's real, it's something. If it's realistic, it looks like something. And so that's kind of where I'm going. And, and by doing that, you kind of satisfy someone who's looking at it. You satisfy the need to understand, and then they can move on and start interpreting the rest of it. So that's what I try to do. Make it look like something, make it look interesting. And I think then that draws you in because you want to see this other interesting stuff. So that's just me. That's what I do. So thanks very much, Scott. Um, so let's go back to our slides real quick. And I got some other stuff to show you. So after I built this stuff and, and I've got my um, shelves ready and got my books ready, then I started stacking the books because I don't want to just kind of, you know, stick them in there. I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be something to make it interesting or it's just, you know, so they will be painted. But I also wanted to make sure that I built them into something. So in the lower portion of this picture, you can kind of see that there's this little L looking piece right here. So that is approximately the width of a shelf. And what I'm able to do with that then is stack these books on that little piece and then glue them and then take them off as one piece like these you see up in the upper right. And then I can place them in the bookshelf um, and, and, and they'll look like, you know, books that have been stacked up. I, I took it further and have some that are kind of tipped to the side and, you know, some that are stacked flat and, you know, things like that. I, I think that's important because if you look at a bookshelf, and it's just, you know, like library books or something. It's just not as interesting. And, and we were dealing with such small scales, 135th, that you want to make sure that everything you do is recognizable. Um, now, those get painted black. 
then they will, and I haven't painted them yet, but they will be painted different. The binders will have different colors. Um, and then I also want to think about older books. What colors were they bound in? A lot of older books, a lot of reds, a lot of greens, a lot of blues, and a lot of blacks. You know, there weren't a lot of yellows. There weren't a lot of bright colors and stuff like that back in the day. It was those four primary colors. So that's what I'll be, you know, using on these. Um, and, and I'm really excited to get to that point. Uh, but it ain't yet. So let's go back to here. Um, these guys, wow, where did I go? So these guys came together, put them together like that. I think they look pretty good. Uh, then this is a little bunk. So, you know, he's working like everybody in wartime. They work dawn to dusk, right? That's it. Uh, and, and, and throughout the night, lots of times. Um, you, you, there's no time off. So I just wanted in this, I didn't want him to go to a separate place. It didn't seem right. So he's just like, boom, there's a place he can grab like an hour of sleep and then get back up and, and go back to work. So I made him a bunk. Still needs a pillow, still needs a uh, painting, and it still needs a blanket. This is just made by creating the frame, uh, just a little wooden frame, and that is tissue paper or toilet paper. So when I do all of these kind of things, I use toilet paper like I've shown you how to do before. Um, it's 50-50 of Mod Podge and water, and that's kind of like my glue setup system and then i'll fold that little piece of toilet paper up i'll put it in there i'll put that um i'll put that uh 50 50 mix of mod podge and water in there that'll soak in that'll you know give it the strength once it dries and then i can do whatever i want with it it's very effective there's also little divots in this thing you can't quite tell with this picture it's not a great picture but there's little divots in there that are supposed to be buttons and i will paint this as a mattress and then i'll put a sheet then i'll put a blanket then i'll put a pillow just like everything i want to build this thing up with layers and levels, just like every single other part that I got. Um, it's just a bunk, but that doesn't mean, you know, you don't put the time into it. Okay, so after the bunk, I did a desk. And I really wanted to talk about this desk because, um, let me see if I can do this. I'm going to try a different, no, that's not going to work. Sorry, I was trying a different shot. Um, but basically... These maps are real maps from World War I. And it's, as just as, it's, it's just as simple as you would think. Um, what I did was, and I've got them over here to show you. I'll go online and I'll find some maps. Um, and I try to find, um, you know, something that doesn't have any copyright you know, that's really important. So I go to like archives and things like that. That's, that's a great place to do it. Typically like national archives, it's okay. I, I think I've talked about that before. It's, it was kind of cool too. This week I got my first email from the national archives, which was nice. You know, it just tells you about stuff's going on. But anyway, quit stalling. This is um, what I do with those. So I just put them on a piece of paper like this. And I also use this. I like to use vellum. So this is 100% chiffon rag. I don't know what that is. I think it is, um, it's using cloth fiber, not wood. I, I look, don't, I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm just pulling stuff out of the air. So I don't know. But what I do like is the thinness of it. There's a bit of transparency to it. And so when I print a map on it, like you'll notice in the picture, I can, I can like roll the map. And then I can unroll it. And then when I glue it down, it looks like it's been rolled. You see that? Um, that's this, this vellum, this chiffon vellum. And I just think it holds the color real nice. Um, it, it, it feels the right weight for a map that scale. I, I don't got a better way to put it, I guess. And, and it works really well. I've used it before. These are the same ones I've used before. I've also got... Um, on here, these are all World War I British posters. So these are going to be going in there at some time. And um, I think they're great. I, it, it works really good. So again, what I use is vellum paper. And that's what I like to print on for these. I just simply cut them out for maps. I roll them up 
And then when I enroll them, I get a really nice, looks like a map. Um, and then I got a couple of, couple of comments here. Scott says, uh, Scott says, I've heard the term. Oh, I'm so sorry. We, we already got that one, Scott. Thank you very much. Um, and um, same here. I'm adding some details from my MAK Falk uh, cockpit, Greeble, Greeblies and wire and things that look cool. What are they? I don't know. Just belongs there. I agree, Martin. It helps, right? There's plenty of times you've, okay. I, I'm imagining we've all opened the hood of a car, right? You open up the hood of a car, you know, it's an engine. You know what all those wires do? Maybe. And, but it works. And that's exactly it. You know, we know it's supposed to be there. And so I'm just trying to simulate that with that. So yeah, very good point, Martin. Hey, Neil's here. Hello. Hi, Bill. Just got home. So I'm watching now. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Neil. I, I mentioned you earlier. Um, Neil does just the wonderful uh, one six scale World War One. I'm sorry, World War One diorama, but he also does World War Two. And the first one I saw, it was like an Indiana Jones one, the cabin. Brilliant. Got to go look at Neil's stuff. We're going to have Neil on. We, we tried to work it this week. It was just a really busy week. We couldn't work it out. And, and here's something else. I, I, I want Neil on. And, and, and Neil's agreed, and that's wonderful. But I've also got a couple of other guests that I've already recorded, uh, John Harrison for one of them. And I want to get John on here before I have another guest. I feel bad that I haven't got John's stuff done yet. So I'm getting that done, folks. Then we're going to have Neil on, and uh, if Neil's still good, and, and I really appreciate it. Uh, because I, I want to get, get more than my ideas out there. Sure, I'm giving you ideas that are my ideas from other people, okay? But I think there's some direct responses that you can get from other people that are really, really valuable and to go to their sites and to go to see what they do and even have conversations with them because asking questions from these great and wonderful builders is, is, is how I've, I think, you know, up my game a little bit. And uh, everybody's just been so wonderful about answering this question. So thank you very much for coming on, Neil. I really appreciate it. Scott has a point you're making it sound like they're staying at motel six well he's not exactly staying at motel six but i definitely want to have that level okay we, i think we talked about this campaign furniture does everybody know what campaign furniture is does anybody know what campaign furniture is when the british um uh went out and did their colonization and there's a whole other topic we don't need to get into that but the point was there was a need for furnishings and that, and the need for these furnishings was to have something that could um, take going from maybe a dry climate to a very wet and hot climate or a cold and wet climate to a hot and wet climate. Well, the point was this furniture in, in making that transition, wood swells, wood moves, wood does things. And so when they would do that, when they would first get these furnishings like down to India or even South and uh, South Africa um, and, and middle parts of Africa, um, Burma, well, their furniture would come apart. So what they did was they started making furniture in a special way. Number one, you know, considering that it's going to come apart if they don't do this. And number two, they put these little brass fixtures that held the stuff together. So when the glue failed, if the glue on the furniture would fail, these brass fixtures would hold it together. Once it got dry enough, the glue actually reactivates and glues it back together. So, you know, it was this really neat thing. So this kind of furniture was born out of the need for travel, okay? And going on campaigns and, and having something that would, that would last through that. Well, the other thing that spurned that was the British officers need to bring specific items. Look, they didn't have computers, obviously, and a book was the best reference that they could get. OK, and so the British officers would bring books in little bookcases and they would have little tables and they would have little bunks and they would have little nightstands and they would have little lamps. All of this stuff then would go into this uh, footlocker or different cases. And then all of this furniture on its own would typically break down sometimes into its own case, own carryable case, or to fit in like a larger case. But everything was very, very well engineered to do this. It's a fascinating type of furniture, but it's all based on a need for getting certain items 
of both comfort and, you know, technical and tactical need because it's a military. Well, I kind of think that is a, a very, um, I don't know the word. It's just, just like so over the top. It's so, you know, I need these things. Do you really? It's, it's just like bringing those things from home. I, I thought that was neat. And so to try to show that they've done this is really what I'm trying to do. I had a great, well, we haven't gotten there yet, but I want to talk about the chalkboard that I created because it's this massive chalkboard. And so please remind me, I got to talk about this a little later on. I think Earl, uh, you know, one of my friends online talked to me about it earlier this week and I wasn't trying to make a smart alecky remark, but I thought it was a pretty interesting remark. Uh, and, and it talks a lot about the British uh, military. So uh, thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, Sleazen says, I saw someone do the same thing to make tarps for a tank, putting Kleenex in a mix of water and PVA glue, then muddling it on the tank and waiting for it to come dry. And it works perfect. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to do anything but water. Okay? I do the glue because the glue gives me a little bit more hold. But I saw this technique when I was a little kid in a magazine. You can just take a piece of a square of tissue paper, toilet paper, and wet it or, or drape it across something and just wet it and leave it, okay? And by doing that, when it dries, it will hold that shape, just toilet paper and water. You do not need to put anything with it. But by putting something with it, then you're going to give it more strength, the thing that I try to do is when I'm going to actually drape it over something, I only use the water and I only use the water so that I can remove it after it's dry. If I had the Mod Podge in there with the water, it could stick to the surface. There's things that you can do to make sure that it doesn't like using Saran or something like that. But if you put the Mod Podge on there, it can stick to the surface. If you don't use the water, then after it's dry, you can take it off. And then I would use like TS-80 or something clear to spray it and fix it. Because if you do put water on it and it doesn't have any Mod Podge in it or even paint, it will get soft again. So there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, and, and, and maybe that's something to look at later on. But yeah, it's something to be cautious of. You can do the toilet paper trick or technique, I guess with or without Mod Podge, and there's a specific way to do it, or, or reason, I should say, for doing it with water and without. Okay? Or, or with glue and without. I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Sleezing. Uh, John says, do you ever run into the problem that the ink smudging on the vellum? No, I haven't had that. Um, I have had, and that's a great question, John. Thank you. I have had the issue where I've put CA glue on it and it would want to run. Yes, that's happened, but not like just handling it. It, it hasn't happened. Um, it, it seems to get into the vellum. It's not, vellum isn't like um, some of those clay coat, very shiny. They actually use clay um, uh, on the paper uh, and it's called clay coat. And it's that really, really smooth, shiny, like on the cover or something like that of a book. Uh, that kind of paper or really, really heavy bond paper. Um, and that can get your ink to just sit on top of it, right? And, and smudge right off. The vellum is is a paper. It, 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 it soaks in. So there's a porousness to it. So it does soak in. So yeah, I've not had that issue. But a little CA glue on it, it can. All righty. Thanks very much. So we are talking about maps. And if anybody has any other questions about that, I, I, I love using these maps. I love rolling them up. And, and I'm going to have a bunch more. There's also some letters to the right on the desk. And those letters are actual um, World War I communiques and letters and things like that that I got online. And you just shrink them down. And it's just really simple to do it. Go when you're shrinking them down, don't try to do it by percentage, do it by actual size, and, and it works just out just fine. Here's a uh, a uh, chalkboard, a small chalkboard that I made for over his desk, which is going to be upstairs, and, and, and we'll see that. And then here's the large chalkboard that I made for the room, and, and this is what I was talking about before 
Um, this is a massive chalkboard. This is like a, a 10 by 12 foot chalkboard. Um, but I had a really good time with it. I had, you know, this big space. You can see this big space on the side of the wall there. I really wanted, well, initially I, I, I kind of thought I wanted one of those ladders that rolled back and forth, but just the configuration of the, the steps getting in it, the, the staircase, I, I couldn't do it. But I did want this massive chalkboard because I just remember pictures in, in I, I actually had some pictures in like early on Einstein or something like that. And they're using these big chalkboards. Oh, and, and there's that movie that came out a few years ago. Um, and uh, it had the women working for NASA, wonderful story. And uh, they were using these massive chalkboards. And so I thought, yeah, massive chalkboard, love it. Well, I had the question this week and it was awesome. And, and I knew it was an issue, but someone said, so how are you getting this massive chalkboard in that room? It's underground, remember? I mean, you know, look, this thing is huge. And, and, and I did consider cutting it up, like, like, you know, cutting it into four pieces so that it would, you know, make sense to get it down that, um, that, that vertical shaft they have to come down and then through the tunnels and all that kind of stuff to get it into this room. And then I kind of got smart alecky, but I thought it was fun, not meant to be mean. I said, well, uh, consider this. Captain Livens is standing in front of the gathered British Royal engineers saying there is absolutely no way you could possibly get that chalkboard down underground intact. And then he just walks away. And so that's my answer. I literally am saying that it's it's like a challenge to the Royal Engineers, you know, His Majesty's Royal Engineers in 1916, uh, get it down there and they do it. So I know that's probably a cop out in, in trying to explain how this thing got underground, but I like the idea and, and I think it's kind of fun uh, to give you know, um, uh, uh, a unit like that, that obviously any military unit from any country, by the way, there is pride and there's, there's, you know, esprit de corps and, 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 you know, don't tell us we can't do something. Um, all militaries are like that. And, uh, I, I thought that was fun. I, I just thought it was good. So that's what I did, uh, in consideration of this massive, uh, uh, this massive chalkboard. I just let the engineers have it. Uh, I got more comments here. Hidden figures. That's exactly it, Paul. Um, uh, just a second. Did you ever run into the problem with the ink? Okay, so we got that. So Paul Christopher says Hidden Figures. Yes, wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, please do. It was a really good movie. And I just, there's those move, there's those moments in the movie, you know, Hidden Figures, where somebody will say something and you're just like, oh, got him, you know, and it was great. There was, there was like stuff like that. So it was, it was a really fun movie. Um, and then Mark, years ago, engineers designed with ink on vellum. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and that's what they still use for like overlays when you're doing drafting and architecture and stuff like that. Overlays are, you use vellum quite a bit. That's, that's what I remember it for. Hey, Erdink is here. Hey, thanks very much, Erdink. Thanks for coming by. It's great to see you. Um, so we are talking about Captain Libin's lab. So let's go back to that. So here in Captain Libin's lab, I've got all these things and I want to demonstrate today to show you how I made the chalkboard because I, I really honestly love this chalkboard. I think it came out great. It's really simple to make. It doesn't take all that much time. And I, I even got where it looks like it's been smudged, where it's been erased, you know, and uh, I just use real chalk. So I'm going to show you a little bit later on how to make the chalkboard. Uh, I think I looked at that. Sorry, going the wrong way. This is my ladder. I really love my little ladder. I did not use balsa or um, basswood in this. Um, this is actually, I don't, is it? I think it's Sapili. I think this is a Sapili ladder that I made. And, and I really took my time on this. Um, and, and, and it was a lot of fun. Um, the top has a little slot there so we can have like an eraser and some chalk. Um, so back to this, um, what I did was actually pretty simple. Um, and I'm going to show you, and then, and then later on, I'm actually going to demonstrate it when we're like done looking at all the pictures, but I just want to show you what I did. So this is one 32nd plywood. 
It's birch plywood, super thin stuff, pretty strong, works great. Well, all I did was I painted it with flat black and I just used, you know, very, you know, easy to find stuff, Rust-Oleum, it's paint and primer, flat. Um, and I painted it with that. And then I went ahead and um, let it dry. And I just took some 320 wet dry sandpaper and and just knocked it down. I don't want it smooth completely. That's not the issue. If it's completely smooth, it's not going to pick up the writing that you put on it. But you don't want it fuzzy. The, the natural surface is pretty smooth, so it's going to be okay. It's just that when you put something on it, it's, it's going to raise the fibers. So 320 on it, kind of knock it down. And then, well, I'll show you the rest later, but then you just paint on it and then use some, use some chalk and it works great. Now, I've not even sealed what I've done yet. So I've not sealed it or anything like that. So we're going to look at that later on and I'll show you how to do it. And I think it just comes out great. Okay, so um, next is this. And I had some fun questions about this before Paul uh, was asking about that before we started. This is supposed to be um, Captain Livin's little chemistry setup. And look, I'm no chemist. I, pff, you know, I don't know anything about compounds and things like that. I know the names, right? Um, but I went online and I found a picture and I remember these, you know, that's where I look for it. Um, we have this little rack and then you have these things attached to it that allow you to route properly um, some chemicals flowing in a specified direction to, to either distillation or whatever you're going to do with it, right? Separation, distillation, but whatever, joining, I don't know. So cooling, heating, all that kind of stuff can happen in this. Uh, and then I just built all these other little things around it to include my little Bunsen burner stand over there on the left. And, uh, you know, I think everybody, you know, remembers that from, you know, primary school. Um, and then I put it together. Now here are two shots of it. These two shots are from like the working side of it on the left. That's where you would be standing looking at it. And on the right, that's how you're going to see it in the diorama because you're going to see it from its backside. So when I'm building this, I mean, I think that's, you know, kind of important to think about. You know, we talked a lot last week, I think about, you know, uh, your, your view or your direction of view or the angle that you're viewing it from. Uh, heck, I think it was a few weeks ago. But anyway, we were talking about that. And so the point here being that I'm building this from the perspective that I'm going to see it the way you're seeing it right now. That's how you're going to see it. So I'm always going to be seeing this thing from the back side. And, and that's just, you know, that perspective thing. So that's just something to kind of keep into consideration when I'm building something. That's the working side, but you're only going to see it from the back. So kind of keep that perspective as you're, as you're working on building your stuff. And I think it's very helpful. I had to tell myself a couple of times as I'm placing things on these two little, well, it's just one it's shown twice in these images. I had to, you know, ask myself a few times, Hey, you know, how am I going to see this? What's this going to look like from the backside? And, and, and so that's just something to consider. So here is kind of cumulatively what I built this week just for the lab. And, and, and these are the things that are going in the lab. You know, I, I started with these uh, and then I, I went to this. Now here you can kind of see the books. The books are now kind of black. And, and that is just that black spray paint so that I can go in and paint the bindings um, different colors later. I wanted that kind of pre-shading. Um, and then there, of course, there's the little chemistry setup. Um, okay. And so we're going to talk about knives next, but I want to get back to Paul because Paul had asked previously about our little chemistry setup. And so I'm going to get my picture back to something like this so we can talk to Paul. So Paul says, uh, Bill, we had material chalkboard that were on roller systems so they could write on it and hide before it came into class. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I love those, you know, the big sliding ones in university and stuff. I I've never been to college, but I, I've seen them and stuff like that in audited classes. And, and so, yeah, they had these massive, you know, big ones that you were on and you had to have a ladder to, to write on the darn thing, uh, because you're in a big, uh, a, a very big, um, area. 
Uh, it doesn't matter if you can't see detail. The fact is that it's there and will be in real life. Yeah, and that's really a good point, uh, Neil. You know, I really try to, and, and this is some of those things because I, I love um, – like movie making and stuff like that. And it's the matte painting that I really kind of think of when I think of the stuff that I build. Um, uh, now, Neil is a little different. His stuff is so precise. He's got a larger scale, certainly, but still, his stuff is so precise, the detail doesn't degrade the closer you get. Mine does. So if you get super close to mine stuff, the detail degrades, meaning that it doesn't look as good right? It just doesn't. It, you're, you're so close. You're like, well, wow, it's a big boom. So, you know, there's a difference there. And, and the reason is this, matte painters. So matte painters are like, what they do is I can't film the entire scene. I can film this scene, but I've got this massive, massive vista behind the scene. And so they'll paint that. These days they do it on glass or whatever. And, well, they can composite it now, but they used to do it on glass. And they still do. And so that matte painting is suggestive. If you get up close to it, again, like my stuff, you lose your detail. You just burn it right out. It's not there. But what you get being back away from it is you get the suggestions. It's completing an image, but your brain gives it all the depth that the actual image would have, like, say, if it was a photograph. Um, so that's matte painting. And that's kind of how I consider what I do too. I want to give you the suggestion. I want to put all the stuff in place, but I don't necessarily want you to get all that close to it. I'm trying to give your brain something to, to, to construct your own story around. That's what I'm doing. So it's much like matte painting. It's not a hundred percent detailed. And, and, and I don't know if, I mean, I'm still going to continue to get better, certainly. And, and, and I'm striving for that, but I like how it comes out now. I like that when you look at it, your mind has to actually go in and create that detail. And it creates in a such a way that you understand it better. I, I read this thing on it. There's a whole psychology behind it, sight and interpretive reasoning, all this kind of stuff. And I just love it. And that's what I do. So, uh, let's see. Um, and we already got Neil's stuff. So, thank you very much. Now, I want to talk to you about something a little different. I am going to talk to you about knives. And I just thought this was something interesting because this last week, I just switched over to scalpels. Um and it's not like I, I just trashed my other knives and I'm not going to use them anymore. No, it's it, for a very specific reason. I wanted to get scalpels cost. So when I went to go back and buy some of my exacto knives, I used to get a hundred pack and it's like $35. <clears throat> Excuse me. It used to be, I think a lot cheaper, 22. Now it's $35 for a pack of the number 10, blade or the number 11 blade, the, the, the standard, um, exacto type blade. I do like exacto. So I do get exacto blades. I don't get the other ones. They might be just fine. I don't get those. Um, but it's a little expensive. And so I, I knew that a lot of people used, um, scalpels and I wanted to try it. So I did. And I got a pack of 90 blades, varying sizes and two handles. And so the pack that I got had these two handles in it, one for a small and one for a large uh, uh, size blade. And the pack had, was split between large and small blades. And I love them. They work great. I've also got these. These were custom made handles that I received some time ago. And they're for large blades. And they work great too. A little bit more ergonomic and, and, and work great. So... The main difference that I have with these is, are they sharper? Um, yeah, I think they are. They, they do seem to be a little bit sharper for me. Um, and they are a little bit more flexible, which is good and bad. When I'm cutting basswood, I don't want to use a scalpel. I mean, I have, and it works, but you got to be really careful because it's so much more flexible you could break the blade. The exacto style knife 
or the, the classic hobby knife, that is a thicker and stronger blade. So if you're cutting something heavy, I would not, I mean, it depends on if you're cutting through it is what I should say. Use your heavier blade and I think it works great. So I've got a bunch of, of knives like that. I've got two of the larger um, X-Acto knives and I think they're great. I love them. I've used them since I, well, I got my first, no joke. I got my first X-Acto knife kit at nine years old for my ninth birthday. And um, well, this one is from that set. And I'll, I'll tell you, I just love them. Uh, and then I've got two of the smaller ones and I, I keep these blades in their standard. They work great. And I think, you know, there's nothing crazy about it. It's just, I get a better angle with this one. Um, this one is modified. Now, <clears throat> this is a regular, this is not something you buy. This is just a regular X-Acto blade holder. And I just shortened it. And I really like working with it. It, it, it fits in your hand, right? And it works in very small, tight places. So I can get in there and get in small places. I really like this one. I just cut it off, cleaned it up, you know, so it's nice on the end. And it's actually very effective. I use this now uh, more than I use the regular one that it's made from. Okay. So I took off about an inch and three quarters and it's solid. So there's no problem with it. Um, and, and I really like it. Um, these guys, the, uh, scalpels, like I said, I believe they're sharper. I don't know. Uh, it's, I've had them over for a week, but they work great and they seem to do a really nice job cutting. Um, they're, you know, be careful if you're just new to it like me and, and you're looking at it because you got to be really careful about how you put them in there. You can cut yourself obviously really, really easily. Um, but we use knives all the time should be okay. So light duty, perfect. They are sharper. Um, they are flexible and, um, they're cheaper. They're a heck of a lot cheaper. Um, let's see how well they last. That's what I haven't done yet. So, um, I used them all week. I used them on everything that I would typically use my other one, except heavy, heavy wood. And they performed great and heck of a lot cheaper one heck of a lot cheaper. Okay. So enough on knives. And if you have any questions, obviously about the knives I use or, or anything like that, please just ask. And, uh, I'll tell you about it. Uh, what's up for next week. Before I do that, I want to get some questions. Okay. So, uh, Martin says, uh, wasn't Matt Penning developed for Star Wars? It was used in Star Wars, but it, Matt Penning's been around for years and years and years and years. Um, I believe, you know, the French film Shot to the Moon, they didn't do matte painting, but they had backdrops like in stages. And matte painting is literally a, a it's, it's, it's like a development from stage. You know, you have a stage play and you have a backdrop, you know, it's all cloth and it's painted on that, that cloth. Um, that's basically where matte painting came from. So in, in films, they just were able to do newer matte paintings on glass and things like that. I know that one of the great matte painters that, that I think is, is wonderful. And his son actually worked on star Wars, um, worked on 20,000 leagues under the sea in 1954. And I'm so sorry. I can't remember his name. Um, I'll get it. Uh, but yeah, he was a matte painter in, in the fifties and his son was a matte painter on star Wars. So that's, that's kind of neat. Somebody might even know that because it was, uh, real soon. It was, um, uh, 1907 was the first time matte paintings on glass. There you go. Thanks very much, John. Um, John, if you wouldn't mind, if you're looking stuff up or maybe you just know that because you were in the industry, um, because John's an animator, by the way, if anybody doesn't know, uh, among many, many other things. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, I, I forgot what I was going to say, but I was going to say something about, um, oh yeah, the, the gentleman that did the, the painting, I'll get his name and, uh, and then put that in because I think it's really fascinating. If you look at the ILM, uh, special that was just on Disney plus, if you have that service, um, there was a great show, multiple part, five part, I believe about, uh, the start of ILM and uh, Industrial Light and Magic and uh, the people that made Star Wars. And so um, 
that gentleman is in that special. So it's, it's really neat. And, and I seen him in, uh, or his father, I had seen in um, other special features for 20,000 leagues. Cause it's one of my favorite movies. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, John. Neil says, I tried matte painting for my diorama backdrop, but added some tree stumps and lights with some fiber from duvet to make it look like smoke. You know, and I saw that and it looks really good. It's, it's, it's the background and the lights on it look great. If you haven't seen, Neil has also done some really neat videos in situ, you know, basically in, so you're supposed to be in the scene, not just taking pictures of it, but taking pictures from within it. Great stuff. And uh, it's something that Neil and I have kind of texted back and forth. I've always wanted to kind of take one of my dioramas and make a little video from it. I mean, it's a natural thing. You know, we make videos and blah, blah, blah. But I haven't done it yet. Um, so, yeah, that's something that's on the back burner that, that I'm just kind of sussing out up here. But I think it would be really fun to make my diorama, right? And then build it in such a way that I have the story already figured out, which is different for me because I always typically have the story developed during the building of the diorama. But have it figured out and then build it so that I could film that story based on it. And each little vignette in the, in the diorama, like I like to do, is part of the story. And you can go to it and come back for it and it has elements, blah, 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 just like scenes in a movie. So yeah, I think that's really cool. And I think Neil is, is, is beyond that. He's, he started doing some of that stuff. So it's really, really cool. If you get the chance to look at Neil's site, you got to go. And folks, I, I want you to know, I get really excited when I see somebody that, that does something wonderful and I, I want to share it. And if you have done something, um, and I say, it's got to be good. No, I just want to see your stuff. Because I think it's wonderful to share. Um, I put stuff online kind of after I'd figured out how to do it. And it's almost a cheat, right? Because some folks are getting on there and I'm going to show you my journey as I learn. And I'm still learning and I'm still improving. So I'm not, you know, that. But the cheat is I didn't start raw. I think it would be wonderful to see someone starting raw and then going and, and, and learning the craft and, and, and building that. That's a wonderful journey to be able to show online. Maybe I'm the only person ever in, interested in that, but I think that's a wonderful thing to be able to convey. And so if you're, if you're new or you're getting back into it and you're, you're not sure about this stuff, please film yourself. There's a few reasons for it. Number one, it's really fun to go back and look at. Number two, your family. In years and eons to come, you can share that video with them. And number two, it'd be kind of fun if you put it up online and you shared it with your friends and showed them how you're progressing with something like that. So just, I don't know. I, I think it's really fun and I think it's a wonderful thing to do. And um, it, it can get you some really neat results. And it gets you to look a little bit different at your diorama. And that's not a bad thing at all. When you're taking a different perspective at the thing that you're working on, and, and you can understand that perspective. You know, you look at it from a different angle. You, you see it in a different light. You know, people say that, that term. Um, it gives you more ideas and it, and it helps you kind of build it in a way that satisfies the, the, the thing that you saw that's different, wrong, right, or whatever. You want to exemplify it. It's right. It's not quite right. So you want to change it. Taking a different view at something, taking a different perspective, walking away from something and coming back to it. These are all wonderful ways of taking a look at what you've done and making sure you're getting to the point that you, you want to be at. And changing your perspective, that can really make a difference. Look at something through the lens of a camera. It looks different than seeing with your eyes. That right there is a perspective change. You don't have to publish anything, but just look at your stuff through your camera. Look at it with a different view, and that can sometimes solve problems for you uh, that, that maybe you're having. Okay, so I I tried to... Ma okay, I'm sorry. Now, Martin says, I seem to remember that the hangar scene on the Death Star with all those stormtroopers was done that way. Yes, it was. You're absolutely correct. And, you know, and what I'd like to see, and I, and I think some folks have done, is they've gone back to the original A New Hope, and, you know, the original three movies that that um, George Lucas had gone back in and, and, you know, digitally changed some things to get his final vision. And I, can, and I can't fault him for that because if you, if you had a, an original vision and you wanted to go ahead and, and get there and you just couldn't do it because the technology didn't exist, which is George Lucas's story, 
and you went back and changed it, great. But I'd like to see the one that I saw in the theater, right? Because the one that I saw in the theater had some of those stormtroopers in that particular scene, Martin, but more were added, right? There was more depth. And I'd kind of like to see it the way I saw it as a kid. Because now my perspective and my memory has been so skewed with watching it so many times now with the new stuff, I bet it would be completely surprising to see that original one, even though it was only two or three minutes, maybe, maybe more, but that was changed. But I'd love to see it from there. Uh, kind of goes with that perspective conversation. I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. And John says, uh, uh, Harrison Ellenshaw. Yes. Uh, is the map painter you're talking about? His father was Peter Ellenshaw, but ILM used quite a few exceptional map painters. Absolutely correct. Yeah. But those are the gentlemen I was speaking of. Um, because his father, uh, Peter Ellenshaw is, is very prominently in the special disc that they put together for 20,000 leagues under the sea. Uh, it was narrated by, um, John Reese Davies. And, uh, so he narrated this whole thing and it, and it looked at the building um, of the Nautilus and the, and the, the filming of that, that entire movie. And it was just really wonderful. Thanks very much, John. I really, really appreciate that. Um, Cause I really enjoyed that. And, and if you like this kind of thing and you're, and you're thinking about, you know, I want to, I want to get my dioramas better or I want to get into dioramas. You know, what do I look at? I mean, sure. I'm, I'm happy to share what I know, but what I also know is where I've gotten this information has a lot to do with uh, the, the making of movies and the special features that are in, in a lot of movies. I think the heyday of having those special features was probably in the like the 90s and stuff like that because there was a lot more of that going on because DVD sales were huge and to make your DVD sell more, you want to put more content on it, right? Well, that's okay. There's great movies from the early 2000s, like The Lord of the Rings, that's one of my personal favorites, has fantastic information on it that you can go and look at. I watch these things because it's interesting, certainly, but I also do it because I'm, I'm trying to gather information. There's lots of wonderful information about movie making and stills and shots and focus and lighting and perspective and, and all these things they talk about it so casually but it is casual to them because it is so ingrained in what they do and so if you're just trying to learn that stuff it's a wonderful way to pick it up and i hope you like those movies if you like those movies then it's a wonderful way to see how they produced such a wonderful epic uh which which i think lord of the rings was um Again, thank you very much, John. Neil, the Indiana Jones matte paintings were amazing. They were the first ones I saw. Yeah, and Indiana Jones is great. Re everybody, I, I hope everybody remembers in the last one, you know, where he had to cross the chasm, you know, and, and where the camera shifts right at the last moment. And you can see the bridge that Indy had to cross to get to um, uh, uh, the cup, you know, the chalice of Christ in the in the third movie. Um it was a great shot and it was all matte painting and it's neat to see these people work on it too um, because you see them working on it. And then when they step away, it's like it automatically goes into focus. It's, it's a neat, neat feature. So yeah, matte paintings are fantastic. Neil says beneath hell 60 is a must see world war one tunnel movie. Yeah, absolutely. I finished, you know, I had talked about beneath hill 60 for weeks because I'd only seen parts of it. And, and I, I knew it was something I wanted to see when I finally finished watching that movie, folks, if you haven't seen it, it's very poignant. Um, the ending is great. The acting is good. Great. I shouldn't say good. It's great. Um, and I really like the characters. You, 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 you really felt for the character, the main character in the movie at, at, at a very pivotal point where he has to make a decision. You, you felt for him. So I think they did a great job in that. Um, great movie. See it if you haven't. Beneath Hill 60. Um, if you're interested in World War One, it's great. There's lots of other movies out there and some that'll just put you back in your chair. There's one where everyone dies. Virtually everybody dies. Uh, I can't remember the name of that one. I did see it. It's a fantastic movie. Um, wow, what they went through. It. You know, I, I, I've talked about this before. I started these dioramas and starting these projects 
And a lot of times there's something maybe even fun or funny or exciting or something like that getting me toward it. And as I go into it, I, I inevitably like to immerse myself in movies and reading and online and imagery and all these kinds of things. Well, you know, I'm modeling some, some pretty heady stuff. This is World War I. Um, millions of people died, right? Um, it, it was just a, it was a horrific thing. So as you, as you go into it and as you, you expose yourself to this, this, this media that we have available to us today, it very quickly centers you about what actually happened. You, you stop thinking about the weapons and you stop thinking about the deployment and you stop thinking about the mud and you start thinking about the people. Um, you see it in their eyes. I mean, you know, the, the movies that are made, but also then the documentaries that have been produced like Peter Jackson's, uh, um, they shall not grow old. Um, you see the, 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 the look in some of these gentlemen's eyes that are no longer with us for if they died then or later, they're no longer with us. Um, it's very poignant. It's, it's, it's something that makes you sit back and think a little bit. And thinking isn't a bad thing when you're talking about your diorama or anytime, obviously. But it allows you a, a little bit of space to think about what these people went through. And when you're thinking about doing something in your diorama, I think that that gives you the ability to try to put something personal from you. If you're, if you're that emotionally invested in your diorama and in, in whatever you're building, whatever piece of art that you're trying to produce, if you have that emotional investment, that's going to come out. It, it, it really will. And, and I think that's important. Um, I like doing this. You know, this is a very, very fun activity. But there's a point in which you sit back, like in watching those movies and, and seeing those images, that you just got to think to yourself, man, what happened? So when you start asking those questions to yourself, I, I think that's a very good thing. I think that is when you start really feeling your diorama, you start feeling what you're working on and you start putting more into it. You start putting things in it that are going to mean something to those images that you said. Um, I've been just waiting because it's on the surface. I've been waiting to put a shaving kit and a mirror and a picture of someone's loved one in the, in the trench. I mean that right there, that, that, that image is so stark and, and, and so meaningful to me. And, and I think other people, it's not just me, but, but that really brings it home. You know, you're doing a mundane activity in a place that is, is well beyond anything that you ever thought would ever happen in your entire life. And, and, and that's something about soldiers. They understand that. Um, but you're still doing these mundane activities and you're still thinking about the people in your life. There's something about that scene that I have to create. And, and, and a lot of times those things happen early on or, or, or during, but it's those little things. Even if everything, I could have a freaking Ferris wheel in here. I don't care. There's, there's a point in which the meaningfulness of that little scene, you got to put in there and you let it stand on its own. It's not here in support of anything else, but that little scene, that little shaving cup, that little mirror and that little picture of that soldier's, sweetheart, wife, even daughter. Um, you know, that's why you make dioramas and not maybe just a model. I'm not saying I have the answers to that. I'm just saying that's something that means something to me. So maybe it'll mean something to you. I don't know. Um, I've got some comments here. So before I go out on a wacky diatribe here, uh, ba, 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 ba. Beneath 60. Okay, so it's it's also amazing how small the original budget was. I'm building the X-Wing that's almost all one color and ease of cost of painting and details. You're absolutely right, Mark. Those guys, you know, I mean, you've seen some of this stuff. You've heard about it over the years. I mean, it was just low, but well, it wasn't low budget. It was a big budget for, but for all that they did, they were running out of money. They were running out of resources. They were running out of everything because of all that they're trying to put into it. And you know, I think you like, you understand that if you're a, a diorama builder, because there's sometimes you just got to get that one thing. And uh, it's like, man, I don't want to skimp on it. Um, you know, it, it, it can cost some money. But yeah, really, really cool stories. 
Uh, thanks for sharing, Bill. Enjoy your work very much. Thanks very much, Lincoln. Hello. It's great to see you very much. Uh, Link came in a couple of times uh, in text this week, which is really nice. Neil, uh, the trench with uh, Daniel Craig, they all die. I, is it? That's not the one that I'm thinking, because that I I did see the the one with Daniel uh, with Daniel Craig, but this one had um, he played Vision. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. He was also in Wimbledon. Uh, I think he's a great actor. I think um, I just can't remember his name. But uh, he was in it, and um, it was just so sad. It's, mm. I can't remember. I man, I gotta find it though, folks. I will. It's a great, great movie. I saw the movie because you remember the awesome movie. Yeah, really great one, Scott. We talked about that last week. Ah, uh, just man, a really, really good movie. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, one of my favorite figures I did was the shaving soldier in the cabin. Yeah. Isn't that great? And and you did that great, by the way. Uh, it was a little different scene and stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's such a it is such a well known activity. That's the other thing. It, it it brings you right into it. If somebody is sighting down the sights of an anti aircraft gun and they're in the chair and they're like back here like this and you know they get. Well, that's interesting and stuff like that, but you can't really relate to it unless you've sat in an NIR aircraft gun, right? I mean, it, you're in a weird position. You're just all, it, it, you can't imagine what it's like, but somebody shaving. Yep, you can imagine what it's like. And that's the beauty of it. So beauty, I, I love that, Neil, that you put that in there. That's really cool. Martin says, I love this comment, Bill, the realization that you're not only modeling, but immersing in the life and death of people. It's very humbling, actually. It is. It, it, it very much is. Um, you know, my first World War I diorama, I started because I like Black Adder. I, I think Rowan Atkinson in Black Adder is hilarious. And, and um, Black Adder Goes Forth was the one where it's all in World War I. And it is just Oh my gosh, it's it's Hugh Laurie and everybody just hilarious, hilarious. And going from that then to watching some serious stuff, or and like I said, you know, that whole journey of, of, of immersing yourself into it, yeah, totally changed the direction of that diorama. That specific and, and it's doing the same to this. I'm not, I mean, I, I know this now going into it, and 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 so I'm not gonna really alter stuff. But it's it's putting those poignant moments in it and, and trying to recreate that stuff, the realism and and the emotion of it is really important for me. So yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Thanks very much, Martin. I appreciate that. Journey's end. That's the one, Neil. Oh my gosh. That and Paul Bettany. Yes, you're absolutely correct, John. So Neil and John got it. Journey's end. Oh my gosh. If you haven't seen this movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's like one of those Saturday afternoons, you know, you're back home from church or you've gone out for a walk and, 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 and you're back home and it, you know, you got some time and, and, and it can't be outside, maybe whatever journey's end, find it and watch it. Um, oh my gosh, uh, you, you, you just see it, you see it. And the acting was superb. Ab absolutely just great great movie journey's end great thank you so much neil thank you so much john that was a great movie um i am really bad at at, at memorizing words Me memory is just shot to hell always has been but i got the imagery and and great imagery wonderful acting i really think you'd enjoy that movie journey's end yes it's the little things that catch the eye that immerse the audience absolutely you know one of the things that i was doing earlier this week was when I was working on, I don't even know where the heck it is now. Um, where the heck is that little thing? I don't even know. Here it is. When I'm working on this, you know, you kind of, you, you kind of start out with the superstructure, right? And, and, and you think of, okay, this is the generally the thing that I want to build. And, and, and so I'm going to start out with this, right? But as you go on, you realize it's, it's the stuff that's tiny. Just like saying Paul is saying here, it's that teeny tiny stuff, physical, teeny tiny stuff that you see there that draws you in. Number one, it's tiny, so you can't see it and you want to know what it is. But those things that maybe seem the least 
uh, significant on the piece are the most. In this little piece right here, on top of, the, and this is just terrible of me doing this um, to you. Um, there you go. You can see it. So this is supposed to be like a tank of something. Who knows? It's either kerosene or, or diesel because that's what I'm working with. Um, and on top of it, it's just rounded off. And then there's a little tiny thing on top. Well, until I put that little tiny thing on top, which is just a piece from a tank or something, you know, for my spares box, it didn't look right. It just did not have the right look. You know, we have expectations of mechanical things that we've seen before. If I see a tank and I see a hose coming out of it, I want to see a knob to turn it on and off, right? Um, if I see something that doesn't have those elements that where I expect it, then I'm immediately a little bit cynical about everything else that I'm going to see, aren't I? I really want to make sure that I'm putting that stuff in there because it's expected. Um, if I'm building something that is nonsensical like this, there's no expectation um, except a couple. It has to look like it does something and it can't just exist on its own. There maybe needs to like power to it. So you need to have power. You know, those kind of things are expected. And so when you're designing your little greeblies or your little MacGuffins or, or whatever those things are, remember that if, if you're making it look like something, there is an expectation that some elements or some parts or some things are going to be there. So don't forget about those. Okay. I hope I made that point properly, uh, is based on the East uh, Surrey Regiment uh, that my diary was based on is my great granddad was in the East Surrey. Oh my goodness, Neil. Wow. That's something that we need to talk about, sir. Um, so yeah, so that is Journey's End. And Neil, just, you can see what Neil said. So that's something that I'd love to talk about maybe when we connect and, and, and do our, uh, our deal live. Um, that would be great to talk about. Um, I had, uh, relatives at that age, but my grandfather was born in 1900. And so I think he was just a little bit too young though. That didn't lot that didn't stop some people. I know he went into the Navy, but he, I don't think he was in world war one. I. I think he went in the Navy right after high school. So, wow, that's great. I'd love to hear more about that, Neil. Okay, folks. So thank you very much. Um, I want to show what's going on next week. And I have not shown you how to do this yet. And I really want to do that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to this. What is up for next week? So next week, I'm going back to the first room that I started on. So these are things I already built for this room. And um, uh, I'm going to be doing some um, uh, corrugated tent. And, and this is specific because uh, I can't, was it Earl or was it Scott? Scott, it might've been you. It might've been Earl. I'm not sure, sir. But um, I got somebody saying, hey, you got a flamethrower in there. You're, you know, you got some problems. You know, you could burn that thing down. And he's absolutely right. So I, I have shielding here that I'm going to be putting down in the, the test bay. I also, and I think I spoke about this previously, I wanted to lower the floor when I made my little brick backstop for the test lab and, and to, to, for anybody that's not kind of, you know, remember what's going on here in this area. So we've been looking at this area all morning or all day or whatever the heck during the live stream. And then now we're going to switch next week over to this area, the exact opposite side. And what this is, is the testing laboratory for where the Livens uh, large gallery flame projector is going to be tested. It's not the real one, obviously, because of the size, because the real one was actually quite tall. So this is going to be like a prototype. So I'm going to call mine like prototype one. Um, and so that is going to be in there. Um, I lowered that floor because when I made this backstop for it, um, it was going to make this backstop. So the, the, the point that it was going to hit, it was like right at the top. And I didn't want that. So I lowered the floor. So it's going to hit it pretty much center mass on this little brick backstop that I made. So I'm really excited to start that next week. 
Um, there's a lot of more things that I want to do in that area and in that space. You can see I've got some of my blast shielding up there. Um, but I just, I want to work on this entire space because we talked about, okay, where's the fuel? Where is that going to go? Are you going to have, I had folks questioning, are you going to have the entire Libin's uh, flame projector in there? Remember, it's 56 feet long, so I'm not going to have the whole thing in there, but I do want to have the fuel. I do want to have the kerosene and um, diesel mixture. I want to have uh, the CO2 compression, uh, uh, compressed air tanks that, that actuate the, the RAM. They're, they're, they're used for actuating the RAM, but they're also used for the, as the propellant for the ignited fuel that's going to be sprayed into the German lines, which is what the flame projector was used for. So I, I do need to show that and no proper test would, could go without it. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm going to have in this little area. I'm going to put that in there. Oscar, you can see in the picture, he's, he's been helping all week, of course. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Now, here is what I'm doing tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to go to the Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum and we're going to do a build and display. Um, the build and display is something I've done the uh, third time. Well, I've, I've done it before too with my other club, IPMS, but this time I'm doing it with AMPS. I'm still a member of IPMS too, but this one's just going to be with AMPS. And we just go and we're in the museum and we get to build like next to a tank. It's, it's brilliant. Um, you know, you can smell the fuel. You can, it's just a really, really neat thing. And so, yeah, we're going to build and display and talk to, to museum folks coming in and, you know, tell them all about, you know, what we do at AMP Seattle and stuff like that. So that's going to be tomorrow. And it's going to be 10 to four. Uh, I, th I believe the, the museum is open longer, but we're there till about four. We don't want to interrupt, you know, with, with getting them out of there. Um, we want them to be able to close it at, at the proper time. So we're there to, you know, about four. So that's what that is. Uh, do I got anything else I want to show you? I got to see. Uh, oh, so here is, I, I, I like to leave this in because if somebody doesn't understand what we're talking about or, or maybe comes in late or, or, or hasn't maybe seen a, a previous one, I want you to be able to see what this, this is the Libin's large gallery flame projector. And um, here it is kind of, I just took the picture and kind of broke it down into the, into, you know, bigger areas that you could see. And so along the top, that's 56 feet long. The middle set, that is your fuel. That is your kerosene and diesel mixture. There's a big uh, pipe that it's all connected to. That is your accumulator underneath. That's where it's pressurizing the entire system. And then it floods it and shoots it out the top. And then the very bottom one, that is, um, those are all, there's 20 uh, CO2 pressure tanks that, um, are used to, to charge the system and to, to shoot it. So that is what we're building. My patrons, thank you so much, my patrons. I really appreciate it. I think they're called guests now, or I don't know. I don't, they, they don't call them patrons anymore from Patreon, but these are great folks. These are folks that have uh, gone and they uh, signed up for my patron and they see you know stuff that I don't show here. A lot of stuff I do show here too. Uh, but it's there and there's different tiers where I have a group build every Friday night. Uh, we're doing one tonight and it's just for the top tier folks. But once a month, I open it to all patrons. And when we do those group builds, you're online. It's, you know, we're, we're actually able to talk. So there's a screen of you and a screen of me and a screen of everybody else. And so we're able to talk online and build online and just talk about stuff. It's not like me teaching stuff, it, but if you ask me something, I'll do. But what I find uh, a lot is what we talk about is um, model building and how to do this. And have you heard of that? And have you ever tried this? You know, there's just an awful lot of that. John Robeck is, is, is there an awful lot. Evan Davies is there an awful lot too. And again, those are my top tier folks that they are there every Friday. Um, and, and it's three hours at 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific time might be out of the, you know, time zone for some folks, but if you can make it, it's pretty cool. Uh, you need to be a patron, of course, but uh, go take a look at my patron site. You just might like it. That would be kind of fun. Uh, so thank you very much. And what else do I got? I think that's probably it. Uh, oh, I, I do have the balsa wood solution. If anybody is interested, um, this 
is what I use for all of the woodwork that I am doing inside. So I take the balsa wood and I take the basswood and I use this formulation from this site and this gentleman, Michael Robbins, and it, it allows you, I mean, you can make wood black with this stuff. I don't do that. That's a, I have done it. I, I did it for a piano bench out of cherry that I did years ago. But um, what the solution will do is it'll give you that weathered wood look, that that barn wood look. And um, I love it. There's variation. It's not just one flat color. Uh, it looks like you took boards from a pile and nailed them up, which is exactly what they did. So I really like it. Um, if you like that stuff, go to that site and take a look at it. And, and it, if you don't, if you can't find it, call me. I'll figure it out. Uh, ba, 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 based on the, okay. And then Neil says the whole diorama is looking amazing already. Well done, Bill. Thank you very much, Neil. I appreciate that very much. I'm, I'm loving it. it, it it's super fun. Hey, Martin's got to go. Got to go, Bill. Thanks so much. Once again, cheers from Holland, everyone. Thank you very much, Martin. I really appreciate it. And we're just winding up. I'm, I don't know if I'm just tap dancing here, but, um, we are just winding up. So thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please put them down. I'm working with this replay. I got to tell you, it, there's this weird thing that happens at the end of it where I sign off and then it has to like do this downloady weird thing and then I can post it. I was going to be doing them on Saturday mornings, but, but folks were saying, man, I want to watch it tonight. And so... I'm going to, as soon as it's available, I'll post it tonight. It does have to do this download thing after the live stream. Hey, Paul's here. Uh, John says, hi. Thanks, Bill. See you online tonight. Perfect, John. That's great. I can't wait to see you. Paul Goggin. Hey, thanks, Bill. Very for as usual. Good vibes. Thanks very much, Paul. I really appreciate you coming by. And I really, really appreciate you coming in and making a comment, too. Um, so, yeah, folks. Um, uh, what was I talking about? I have, I have no idea. I totally lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you guys are having a great weekend. If you don't get a chance to get to the modeling bench, um, maybe watch a movie. Uh, maybe watch The Journey's End. That's a, that's a really, really compelling uh, movie. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, Scott McLeod says, Later, Bill, very informative and very helpful. Thank you very much. I'm glad. You know, I never did the flipping... Ugh. I never did this. Guys, I'm so sorry. It's really simple. I'll make a separate video. It is you literally, you just put your, you put your um, chalk on there like that and you wipe it off and that gives you your background and then you paint on it. I mean, that's it. That There's our demo. I'm so sorry. I kind of forgot and, and now it's kind of taken up too much time. <laughs> so eh, we'll get it next time. Thanks everybody. Uh, so sorry, I forgot the demo. I just like, I don't know. Uh, Neil says, cheers, Bill, speak in the week. Yeah, very much uh, looking forward to it, Neil. Um, Sleezen, uh, thanks, see you. Can't wait to see further in your progress. Thanks very much, Sleezen, I appreciate it. Uh, and I think it's time that we just go ahead and call this train wreck done. Um, 